Awesome. Okay. Welcome to Porch Play Chat, sponsored by the American Association for Promoting the Child's Right to Play, or more affectionately called IPA USA. IPA USA is a USA affiliate of the International Play Association. And as part of our efforts to promote play, we've introduced Porch Play Chats, which are conversations with um, a variety of people on lots of different topics who are just as passionate about play as we are. You can find the Porch Play Chats on the IPAUSA.org webpage and up in that top right-hand corner, be a friend on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And every Monday, you'll get a new Porch Play Chat. Um, any, if you have any other questions about IPA USA, you can go to the website and click on connect and send us an email and we're happy to walk you through anything you need. So my name is Deb Lawrence and I'm the president of IPA USA. And with me on the porch today is Lisa Murphy. Hey, Lisa. Hello. hello, hello. And joining us today is Ellen Hogan. Welcome and back. We're so Yay. glad you're here. So Ellen is- Let me shut that off. Uh, oh, she's got to turn something. Oh, it's oh. her telephone. Oh, it's her telephone. So I'm going to, that's okay. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, technology, we love it. We oh. don't love it. It works, but I'm just going to move on. Um, Ellen has been involved in early childhood since her undergraduate days, which she says is many lifetimes ago, but I don't believe her. And presentations, she does presentations at conferences, teaching child development. She consults to large and small programs and individuals. She advocates for children and families, and she's the co-chair of the Westchester branch at NAYC and helps to provide parenting workshops on the pyramid model. So Ellen is joining us today to continue a porch play chat she did with us earlier on centers. And today's title is Expand Expanding Children's Play Experience in Centers. Ellen, so nice to have you. It's so great to be back with you. I love this thing. And Good. you know, I actually took your advice. I went to the website and I looked at the whole list and I've been having a great time seeing all the other ones. So if you're um, new to this, I urge you to go to the website and watch some of these because I really learned a lot too. They're, they're truly amazing and they're free to you. So, you know, yeah. I always say to people, you know, you could show a porch play chat 30 minutes at a staff meeting. And then talk about it. And then talk about it. Yeah. That's what I've been telling people to do. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And they're free. And there's, uh, we're entering our third year, Ellen. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Our third year will be over a hundred, I think, by the end of this week of taping. So it's That's really great. exciting. So exciting. So talk to me about okay, what so, do we do to expand? Okay. So we know that when children are in centers and they're, not interfered with by adults, which was my last talk. Mm -hmm. And again, this is, you know, I do understand that with COVID restrictions, sometimes children can't easily go into centers. Sometimes there are limits. I am confident that one day we will all be back into regular classrooms with regular centers. Mm -hmm. So, and I know that there are many classrooms now that have centers and have yeah. children in centers. Mm -hmm. So, hey, Ellen, I'm going to ask you to back up in case we've got some 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 newbies watching and joining us today. Give us the the Ellen rundown bullet list of the centers that you'd be looking for in an in an early childhood environment. Do you have? Um. Yeah. There's a a place for dramatic play which is also called the house corner, the dress up corner, the um, role playing. I mean, that, it's a million names for every center. Yeah. Um, there's a place for building things with large blocks, small blocks. Sometimes the small blocks are in a different center called manipulatives. Um, there's a place for observing scientific things, which is usually called the Discovery Center and scares staff to death more than any of the other centers, which we can talk about on another chat. Especially um, if you say science, 
right? Oh. They go, you can't say I, science I, because no. they freak out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but one of my favorite um, training um, situations was in a group where they were freaked out about science and then loved it and then taught mm -hmm. other people. So we can talk about that at another time. Mm -hmm. um, so we have dramatic play, building, oh, art, mm -hmm. all kinds of arts materials. I don't like the word crafts. No. I don't like when children are expected to make stuff. No. Um, often water or sand or both, depending upon the size of the room and the amount of um, supervision available. Um, did it hit all the big ones? And I think books. Yeah. I think you got all of them except Oh, maybe books, of course. Yeah. Books, books, yeah. books. There is maybe music. And music. Yeah. There are some people who put books in all the other centers. Yeah. I tend to not because maybe it's just habit. I don't know. I would have uh, block building books. Like, what could I build? Picture books. But that was sometimes I put up blueprints in the building in the building area but it was there wasn't much there because i wanted them to really focus on books <laughs> and cooking oh yeah, yeah cooking. cooking cooking i love cooking especially cooking that doesn't involve heat <laughs> yeah well and where children get to actually do it instead of watch the teacher right. do it. Instead of right. watching a, oh, at least yeah. a show <laughs> yeah. i love little ones tearing lettuce and then eating the salad Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, we keep expanding what we're talking about. Yeah, I, because that's the, the way these conversations go. It's crazy. <laughs> so we know as a given when children go into centers and are not bothered by the adults, that they increase their self-confidence, their engagement with the materials, their relationships with each other. They have practice in decision-making, negotiation skills, language skills, problem-solving skills, conflict resolution, learning all sorts of wonderful concepts and so many more. So that's for all these people who might be new to this concept and say, well, what should I teach them in the centers? Uh huh. They're yeah. learning all these other things in the centers that they need more than what anybody could teach them in the centers. Mm -hmm. um, but before we get into what children do in the centers, when I was a director and a consultant and a teacher, trainer, and whatever, I made three adult rules. Mm -hmm. One, items used to be, that are used in a center should be in the center. Uh -huh. This means you don't have children waiting around while you're cutting things up. Uh -huh. or putting things in little bins mm -hmm. or deciding what should be there. Mm -hmm. Adults should do their homework before they come to school. Mm -hmm. So that's one because- So you I mean like the paint cups are full of paint before the kids walk in the door? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the paper's already on the easel, <laughs> ready to go. I mean, the idea that children should be waiting around while adults do this, Mm -hmm. Yeah, is so upsetting to me because well, it's a lack think, of respect for the children. Well, and it also creates behavior problems because sure. who likes to wait? Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah, and so then you're frustrated because you're having some behavior problems when really it's the waiting that's creating the behavior problems. Exactly. So yeah, planning ahead. I think that's the. I think that's the biggest piece of teaching is preparation, whether you're in an early childhood classroom, in a college classroom, preparation. You have to be ready. They can't wait while you get yourself organized. You get your act together first. Yes. So the second rule is the same as the first with a different meaning. <laughs> Items to be used in a center should be in the center, but that means the stuff that goes with the center should be stored in that center. Mm -hmm. Because I've gone into programs where the blocks are over here, but the little vehicles are over there. 
and the little people are over there and the other stuff is over here. Mm -hmm. So if you want to build a road, you have to go two centers down to find the trucks because there weren't any, there wasn't any room in the blocks for those trucks. So on the way to the trucks, different things happen, different things catch your interest. Uh, or you go and you pick up a truck, but on your way back, then you see something else. So you put down the truck. And then when it's cleanup, stuff is all over and teachers get all kinds of freaked out, but it's their fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and I think, and the other thing is- They should organized the classroom so that stuff that's usually used there is together. Well, and the other big piece that I sometimes see is that teachers see the boundaries of the center as hard, right? Yes. You can't go get the people over there. They don't belong in blocks. They belong over here and you can't move them. <laughs> so I agree with you that it is important that all the stuff and other things that kids might want to go get are accessible and hopefully make sense for that area, right? And I mean, the, one of the biggest ones I've seen is that art stuff is not all in the art area. Hmm. You have papers over here. Why? Because we have a cabinet that holds the papers. Hello. And then you want kids to know where things go and how to put them away. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff that belongs in a particular center should be in a particular center. So that's rule number two. And the second rule is a safe, the third rule is a safety rule. If kids can reach it, kids can use it. Mm -hmm. If you don't want or, them or will, it. right? If they can, they, will. they will use it. <laughs> so if you don't want them to reach it or use it, put it away where they can't reach it. You know, every year emergency rooms deal with children with staples in their fingers mm -hmm. from teachers who have said, oh, they know not to touch that. Oh, um, yeah. If you want a kid to be able to staple something together, take out the staple and the stapler and sit down with them. And when they're done, put it away. Safety comes first. Well, or, you know, a natural consequence for a four-year-old is to staple something, staple their fingers. So maybe it's showing them how to use a stapler and they how to be to rely careful. on them to remember it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but we also we need to to that to keep that kind of safety thing going. We we will often err. Uh, making an assumption that because a child is perhaps of a certain age that they know how to use something, right? So, yes, so, so it's that balance. Like, I'm not going to assume you've used a cheese grater. I'm not going to assume that you've not yeah. used one. But if we're making clean mud today, we're going to have a little lesson, a tutorial. You know, I'm not just going to throw cheese graters down and then walk away. And the same right. with a stapler or anything, really. Right. Just, right. And the assumptions. Right. And you're going to introduce it so that they understand you have to be the only thing. And, and I don't like modeling. You know, I don't want to model how I want you to do this or that. But with with materials that teachers may be reluctant to put out because they're afraid there's a safety issue. I'd much rather I introduce the stapler because they love it because adults use staplers. So they want to imitate. I'd much rather introduce and just say what might happen if your finger goes where the staple is going to go in the paper what could happen so that kids are aware of the safety and how to be safe with a stapler instead of just randomly oh look here's a staple i've seen mom and dad use it i'm just going to staple something and then yeah <laughs> and then we have a problem so you know i think there's that balance again just like you were talking earlier ellen about you know, there's a balance in, in what you model. Like, I, I want you to learn to add this way. No, uh-uh. You know, here's the provocation. Do it the way it works for you, right? Or I, this is the way we use watercolor so that our water, watercolors stay vibrant colors, right? We rinse off our brush before we go into a different color. And that is, in itself, is a, a hard learning curve for me as an adult. I can't imagine what like it's like. to mush it around. <laughs> yeah, I think, and some people like to mush it around. Um, there's a, a, a video that I show where the teacher's showing kids 
uh, in a primary grade classroom. You know, the I've had these watercolor paints and they're really expensive ones for five years. And this is how we keep them so pretty. And so she get, sets the expectation. And so your expectations may be different than other people's expectations, but helping children understand that expectation and then giving them a process is is important but but then we go overboard we're wanting to model everything and so you know there's a balance and what what is a safety thing or what is something that I really want to like cutting with scissors you know the kids that do this you know um so how do we use scissors what do we have to be careful with with scissors you know what do we cut with scissors all expectations. Lisa, your hair is reminding me. My sister, when she was in kindergarten, was bored waiting for the teacher to do something or other uh -huh. and cut off a lot of her hair. Uh -huh. And yeah. so when she came home, there was hair on one side of her face and not, <laughs> not hair the, on the other side. <laughs> that was well, weird. This morning, I just got so bored. I just decided to put just it back, of... <laughs> but she didn't have any over there to put that. back. Mm, that's well funny. and I and, and I think again that's the way kids learn right maybe I went to the hair salon to get my hair cut or mom got her hair cut and so I have scissors so I'm going to try to I'm going to try to do what I saw someone else do so I'm imitating yeah. so again the expectations about what we use to cut with scissors and what we don't is is another like safety thing that we could talk about before we give kids scissors, right? Yeah, because there's a whole there's a whole um, genre of things uh, about teaching play skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does one enter play? How does one cut with the scissors? How does one um, all these other things? Um, right now, I want to get back into center. Yes, back to center. So, Sorry. How do children get into the centers in the first place? Hopefully they self-selected them. Yeah. Without having to individually tell the teacher in advance which center they're going to choose. You're laughing because you've seen it happen. And you know that sometimes teachers waste 10 to 15 minutes uh -huh. of valuable center time. Mm -hmm. Making children say out loud what they want to do especially children who are still learning the language may not know the word for the center they want to play in. Mm -hmm. So they say the word of whatever word they know, mm -hmm. and then they go there and that's not where they want. And they want to wander to someplace else. And the teacher has a limit for how long they should spend in the center before oh, they move. No. And no limit. the whole thing is, is ruined for the child. Mm -hmm. So Nobody ever taught me about sending children to centers. When I had the um, meeting time in the morning uh, or at the beginning of the afternoon session, I would say um, in this center, we have a new X or Y that you might wanna look at today. And we have something over here and all the other centers are available. and it's time to go there. Mm -hmm. go and play. I've heard hysterical staff say to me, you can't do that. They're all going to knock each other over. And it's going to be so unsafe. They're going to be running throughout the classroom. I never saw it happen. No. So if you are watching and you're a teacher who's spending a lot of time helping children go to centers, I'm giving you a present. Here's a whole bunch of time every day. Just let them go. They will be okay. And if you have one runner and you know you have that runner, take the child's hand and say, can I come with you to the center right now? Where are we going? Tell me where you'd like to, like to go. Yeah, you absolutely. You can get out of a lot of sticky situations being the child's friend. Mm -hmm. So... I have also seen sending children to centers be manipulative. Mm -hmm. Almost they like a punishment. Decide yeah. who needs to learn this 
mm. and they send them to that center or they decide who has been in this center too much and I want them to go over there. And then you have the people, and Lisa, I know this is right up your alley, when the teacher says, oh, these children are sitting so nicely, they get to go to the centers first. And the wiggly children are the last ones to go to the center, which punishes them for their own physical inability to sit still. Yeah. Which you should understand in the first place that kids aren't going to be able to sit still so long. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and then, then you add to that the fact that some teachers still are putting the limits of the number of people who oh, can yeah. be at a center. That's my next topic. <laughs> or they have the clothespins. Oh, please don't get me started on the clothespins. Or they, oh. And hooks. Oh, yeah. And name tags. Yeah, or they got to oh, wear yeah. the thing. Yeah, or something like that. Like, what is the worst possible thing that's going to happen if six kids want to be in dress up today? Who cares? Yeah, make it bigger. Okay, That's so why they have teachers, wheels. Teachers have literally told me when I've gone into their centers, I was a facilitator for an accreditation process and I used to go visit a lot of centers and they would, I would say, why do you limit the number of children to four? Mm -hmm. That seems to be the favorite number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how they learn four. So which I say, well, how do they learn five or three? <laughs> You know, there are other numbers and four is not so sacred. Mm. There's a wonderful training video and the pyramid model that, and the pyramid model is pretty big on limiting children to centers and showing you all different ways to do it, pictures and, and symbols if the children are too young to recognize names and blah, blah, blah. So here is this little girl who wants to go in a center and the center is full. Oh yeah. Mm. And the teacher sits with her. Well, what can we do? And she's aiming for the child to go somewhere else and then come back. And finally, the teacher is really frustrated. And she turns to the children in the center and she said, do you have an idea of what she can do now because the center is full? And a little, and she asks a little girl who has no clue. And she asks a little boy and he immediately says, she can share my hook. Put your name on my hook with me. And the teacher is like, freak out. She never thought about this before. Mm. And she said, but then we'll have five in the center. And he says, okay. <laughs> it, it is truly. And the we make girl our job. goes off with them and everybody is happily ever after. Yeah, and we but, make our job so hard sometimes. Why and, are we, and we cling, the problem? We cling to stuff that, that doesn't work anymore because somebody 20 years ago said four. And so now we think it's dogma. And we, you know, that from thou shalt which not deviate. I said that wrong, but you know what I mean? I like, what? who cares? It's yeah. making our job so much harder. And this all oh. comes back to the control conversation. It's control, 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 control. Mm -hmm. And what and would when happen? I was when I was a young teacher, um, there were a lot of kindergartens in that school, and I didn't have any numbers, and I didn't have any hooks, and I didn't have any velcro, and I didn't have any of that stuff. And somebody walked in. Well, why don't you have any limits? I said, do you think I went to college to earn two degrees in early childhood to become a center police lady? Right. I had better uh, things to do with my life. I'd rather play with the kids and watch them and teach them and learn from them. Mm -hmm. I tell people in workshops, um, because this is still, this is not- um, I know, it comes up is, all the time. It comes up all the time. And, and how I've- uh, how I talk to people about it for the last few years has been that I, I never, it's not that I'm letting them get away with it. It's not that I'm allowing, I never want to deprive children of an opportunity to have a conversation, that mm -hmm. negotiation piece, right? And so if you're wanting to go, I've never said that there's a, a limit to the number of kids, but maybe you think there should be, but it looks like you're wanting to enter the play. So, you know, that's, that's, you know, there's days that six kids can be around a sensory tub. And then there's days that somebody says, I need my own. 
Mm -hmm. And and so if a child is able to articulate that, like go get them their own individual bucket, you know, that that practicing of the of the conversation. And what if nine children go to the block area? Yeah, who cares? Is there room? Well, then work? I like to sit them down for a second and say, "This looks pretty crowded. What can we do about it?" There's almost always one kid who says, "Well, I could go over there." because they weren't so invested in the blocks in the first place, but their friend said, come play in the blocks with me. But eventually some of them will always say, let's move, let's make more room in the block. And we'll bring the blocks answer, to the table, right? What would you like me to help you move? Mm -hmm. Well, and they're solving and, the problem instead of- yeah you solving the problem that's what i love too how are children going to learn to solve problems if we don't let them solve problems mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and being mindful of not assuming that there's going to be a problem mm -hmm. the other side of it is if you've got mega centers the house and the blocks are all filled today with billions of kids and there's nothing so it's your problem to say how can I make the other centers more interesting? Uh -huh. What can yeah. I do over there to engage children? Mm -hmm. So when there are a lot of children in one center, I will go to a center where nobody is there. And I will say in a not too quiet voice, would anybody like to help me figure out what to do with this? And two or three kids will wander over and then I'll get a clue as to what I can do to that center to make it more interesting. I have found um, that, again, piggybacking and playing with that flexibility and relinqu relinquishing some of the control is, especially with the dress up area, and we've probably talked about this before, but just simply letting Mackenzie keep the dress up clothes on right oh my goodness it often is often gets Mackenzie circulating through the room um so whereas the teacher's perception was that Mackenzie never leaves the dress-up center but it was for real no reason other than the fact that that's the only place you let her wear the shoes so mm -hmm. now if, if we release that one little thing that is doing differently that the the dress-up clothes can leave the dress-up center now, magically, the rest of the room is quite engaging and exciting to Mackenzie because she just wanted to wear the hat for crying out loud, you know? <laughs> That's a great, that is a great example. One of the things that I did when I was a teacher in the classroom and I noticed the kids weren't going to centers, I, I'd ask myself, all right, so I'm going to, or when I was going in to do an observation in a classroom and noticing the kids were in one or two places, Every 15 minutes, and this is how I checked on bias and stereotypes too. Every 15 minutes, I had all the centers labeled and every 15 minutes I said, how many boys and girls were in each area? Just a number, not who. I didn't care about who it was. And at the end of, let's say two and a half hours of, cause they could play for two and a half hours. I could look and say, oh my God, nobody went to books mm -hmm. or uh-oh science is not being used at all or you know i wonder what's going on in the sensory area because nobody went to sensory and that's really unusual right yeah. i think i knew you in a past life <laughs> yeah it, it's just so it's helpful way, way back when i was teaching kindergarten before computers mm -hmm. oh yeah don't talk to me about that i had a, a sheet of loose leaf paper mm -hmm. and you know the pink line on the side Mm -hmm. Well, that part is where I put all the kids' names, mm -hmm. and then I folded columns, and mm -hmm. I had the center's names on there, mm -hmm. and I would check off, and when I saw that in a given week, it was already Wednesday, and three kids had not done anything in the art area, mm -hmm. I would think about why and see if there was a way I could interest them in it mm -hmm. and ask them if they wanted to make something to take home to mom mm -hmm. and then they could come back and play with whatever they wanted to because right now there was nobody over there and 
So I had a sense of who was where and they always chose whatever they were doing. Um, so there's right now um, on the NAEYC Hello Forum, there's a big conversation going on about rotating children through centers. Oh, oh my God. Oh, please. Uh, oh, no. Please don't. <laughs> and I've, it was started by a special ed person, and I've worked with special ed preschools. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's a concept that says because the IEP says you have to do X, Y, and Z, you have to make sure the children go to where they all have it. But it does not mean that after 10 or 15 minutes, you should make children move from what they're beginning to be interested in. It's rude. Right. Especially when rude. you have kids who are having difficulty focusing. Mm -hmm. It may take them half of the center time to just get into something. And then once they're finally into it, you make them leave? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you said it, it's rude, it's disrespectful. And it impedes their learning. Mm -hmm. And it impedes it, their attention to task, right? Exactly. So we keep saying, oh, attention. they don't have an attention span. They don't have an attention span. Well, let me share with you why. Why? <laughs> this is what is happening yeah, in the classroom. It, it's, it's your obligation to help children keep their attention on task. Mm -hmm. So if you have children who are really focused on what they're doing, Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen if you let the center time run an extra five minutes for these three kids who are really into something? Well, I have found, too, and this might be a, a slippery slope or a springboard into a whole other conversation. But I have found from my own experience, center time has kind of evolved through my career. And I'm sure it has with a lot of people. Like, like I remember when I was very first teaching and I was paired up with that total rigid control freak. Center time was like what, what it was like a gift given to the children. Like, okay, we're done with the work. Now it's time for centers. And I know through the years, I've totally broken up with that. So like now in my world, you walk in the door, we say good morning and you go be you where go. you want to be until whatever kind of maybe non-compromisable like like lunch or the yard or whatever. But it really shouldn't matter how long they're there, right? Or what they're doing because the adults know how to interpret and translate what's unfolding for the people who walk in who maybe question it, right? So, you know, people like when center time, I'm like, when you walk in the door, it's, it's really never not center time because I, I think in some overly rigid controlling environments center time is like the equivalent of free play time like go play and it's only something that that is that happens after we feel like we've done the quote-unquote learning and that is you know reinforcing that false dichotomy that it's one or the other and it's never it's never both so I, I think a, a brief reflection on on what we're calling center time and how it's being used in the programs is, is a conversation too. It is, it's a huge conversation because I, we had, I, I had students in a primary grade field experience and they were in kindergartens and the teachers, when I went to talk to the teachers about the, the field experience and what I was hoping they would let the students do and blah, 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 blah. The teacher said, you're going to love us because we do centers. And I said, that's wonderful. But centers to them was rotation. Mm. Every 10 minutes, she would ring a bell. No. And they would say, oh, yeah. And, and so students would come back to me and say, is that what centers are? And I think, no, that's her interpretation of centers. Here's a developmentally appropriate interpretation of centers. Because, you know, that teacher, who knows what her training had been. But I wanted them to see the difference between that interpretation of centers and my interpretation. And it's a wonderful reminder that often in our field, when we use buzzwords or industry lingo, we do err and make a mistake and think that everybody's on the same page. So we're like, yeah, circle time is awesome. Oh yeah, I do circle time, but like, okay, let's, let's define, let's take a second, let's define this. So at least through this next conversation, this is what we're talking about. You know, it's gonna be our, our working definition of that buzzword. 
Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, the center time ends. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are people who say, if you used it, you have to clean it up. Oh. But what if three other people are using it now? Yeah. So one of the things I try to help students and teachers learn, uh, know is, first of all, I have to tell you, there are things I absolutely hate. I hate when people flick the lights on and off or start screaming five minutes to clean up or ring a bell. Oh yeah. Mm. So those things really drive me up the wall. Mm -hmm. So what I would do and what I help other people to learn to do is to go to the center that has the most stuff out about 10 minutes before Mm -hmm. the center time ends and say very quietly to each of the children or to a few of the children at a time soon it's going to be time to put everything away and do x the next item on whatever the agenda is have lunch or go to the playground or whatever and we're going to need to put things away so you might think of soon finishing and then when you finish, you can start putting the things away. And then you go to the next most busy place with the most stuff, the next most stuff, and you'd say the same thing. Mm -hmm. And by the time you get around to everybody, some kids are already starting to clean up. And then you help. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you a real story that happened in my house. Um, I always have toys. So somebody came with a toddler and her husband and somebody else. And the toddler was busy playing with the toys and they were all over the living room floor. And the husband said, you know, we need to leave. We have to see so-and-so. And the wife goes over and says, Without any warning, she starts singing that infernal cleanup song. So clean up, clean up. Yeah. Everybody, and everybody do your share. And she's yelling it with her arms out at her, you know, sticking out from her sides. And the kid is, looks at her and is playing. And the second time it's even louder. Oh, boy. And then the husband says, come on, we have to get ready to go. And she says, he won't clean up. So I quietly go over there, sit down on the floor with him. And I said, this one goes in that bin. Can you put another one in there with me? Mm -hmm. And so in no time flat, all of the things were in the right place. He and I cleaned it up. Mm -hmm. I was definitely not her favorite person. <laughs> Well, but again, you know, the younger but they my are. My self-image didn't depend on her liking me. <laughs> exactly. Well, and you did it in such a more appropriate way, right? For, you know, the I think everybody has their transition song that they sing for cleanup, but you do need to do that prep work before. When, when I zoned a classroom with a co-teacher, we memorized who was there, <laughs> you know, right 10 minutes before cleanup. And then we might go over and say, You've got a few more minutes before it's time to clean up. But but it's it's how, yeah, flicking the lights, yelling across the room, clean up in five minutes. Oh, my God. So we've taken some of those, you know, children need a transitional time to move to the next thing into these directive, loud sort of moments in a classroom to get it especially the auditory kids you must be auditory Ellen because those things drive me crazy too is is the I get auditorily overstimulated right and so you have those kinds of learners in your classroom so if you're flicking the lights or yelling or putting on the crazy music that's the cleanup song and you wonder why they're frantically running around the room you have to reflect and say why is this happening instead of the kids are are just out of control. Why and they, are and they then out it of also control? has who cleans up what? Yes. There are some kids who are playing in the house corner, but when it's clean up, they go right to the blocks because they like to put the blocks away. Mm -hmm. 
Why not? Yeah. As long as they're cleaning, who who cares? If you're clean, if you're playing in this center, you have to clean up the stuff from this center. As long as everybody's involved in doing something. Mm-hmm. And the then theme, the theme here, Ellen, is is control, right? Mm-hmm. All these things that it's, you're talking about. Control and respect. Yep. Yeah, losing, leaving control, right? Letting Not, some of it go. Is yeah, letting it go. Allow you to embrace what Ellen has definitely been talking about. So if we want children to engage with the stuff in the center, we want them to be involved in the learning. We want them to be involved with each other. We need to respect who's there, what's there. How do we treat the stuff that's there? How do we treat the people? How do we set up for what we want to happen? And everything that you've talked about in preparation is indirect guidance, right? It's the indirect guidance that you do in the classroom before children enter, right? Are there, how's the traffic pattern? Is there a place where they can run around in circle, you know, run around a circle? How have you set up the environment? What have you put in the environment? Are you ready to receive? are, Are you ready for children to enter the environment, right? All of that indirect guidance that you do before children, are you prepared, right? Do you have things in place, paper on the easel, paint in the, in the cups? Are, so I think all of that is so important for people to recognize that that is a critical part, that preparation of teaching is a critical part for kids. So our time is up, Ellen, so don't go anywhere. I'm gonna close this out. So uh, to learn more about IPA USA or to see our porch play chats, please go to ipausa.org. And until next time, keep on playing. Bye-bye. Thank you.